Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm John Schofer. I teach uh, classical or Talmudic Judaism in the Department of Religious Studies, as well as uh, medieval Judaism. And I'm here, I will be doing uh, the introduction. Uh, Professor Michal Barasher Segal did her doctorate at Yale University. And well before finishing her, the degree, she was already a known and an influential scholar in more than one subfield of classical rabbinic and Talmudic studies, including Jewish Christian comparison and relations. She is currently the Gruss Visiting Associate Professor in Talmudic Civil Law at Harvard Law School. And she is also Associate Professor in the Department of Jewish Thought at Ben Gurion University of the Negev and was an elected member of the Israel Young Academy of Sciences. Her research is both intensively rich in the tre treatment of Talmudic and related rabbinic sources, and also deeply comparative with a focus on uh, Jewish-Christian interactions. Her first book is Early Christian Monastic Literature and the Babylonian Talmud from Cambridge University Press in 2013. Among uh, many parts of this book that are of great value, in chapter five, she examines the famous story of Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai and his time in a cave, and her use of cr Christian monastic texts enables her to generate new insights into this heavily studied and very popular story. Her second book is Jewish-Christian Dialogues on Scripture in Late Antiquity, Heretic Narratives in the Babylonian Talmud from Cambridge University Press also, 2019, and a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award in that year. Today's talk um, will examine network analysis as, uh, as a way to examine connections between Judaism and Christianity. And then titled the talk is It's Complicated, Jewish-Christian Relationships in the Babylonian Talmud. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. I need to turn this on, right? This way? OK. So thank you all for having me. I'm actually, uh, it was not obvious for me to be here. I uh, had to make a decision to come, and it was not an easy one to do. Uh, so first I want to say thank you for inviting me and distracting me from uh, three weeks of hell that my family and my friends have gone through when I've decided to come. But um, just show you this picture before I start, because I can't without. I've been staring at this for a while. This is a picture that was taken two months ago from a kindergarten in a kibbutz called Neve Nir Oz. And all the kids that are in this picture are either murdered, kidnapped, or injured. None was spared. Um, and so coming here and talking about Jewish-Christian relation was a tough decision to make. Uh, when my family and friends have gone through uh, what we never thought we would have to go through again. And, uh, but I found that I find comfort in talking about relationship between Jews and Christians and religion and, uh, and hoping for a better future. So I'm actually grateful for the invitation to come and um, uh, distract myself. I'm using you as a distraction from that and hoping for a better future. So uh, my talk today uh, is basically uh, a talk that uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a big project, and I'm telling you about it while I'm doing it. It's not a, f it's, I'm not done. I'm just thinking ahead, and I'm showing you the beginning fruit of it. Uh, and, and, and it really uh, in shows an inter and, and really uh, um, building off a few of my uh, different uh, interest in research together into a project and I want to tell you about that. So it's it basically what I do in my field of work as I, I look at rabbinic uh, literature and I try to find the interaction with Christian sources of the time. So we're talking about late antiquity, we're talking about the first few centuries uh, uh, of the common era and but this specific project takes that interest and interact it with um, new methods from computational tools and trying to use that to advance the study of Jewish-Christian interaction to another level. Uh, the, the, the text that I use to talk about Jewish-Christian interaction in the first centuries is the Babylonian Talmud. I'm sorry if this is familiar to you, but I kind of learned to assume, not to assume knowledge. I will talk a few more minutes about that. So the Babylonian Talmud was redacted around the 6th or 7th century CE, but holds um, 
traditions uh, going back to maybe first century CE, maybe a little bit earlier than that, uh, but um, has scholars talking quotes from them going first, second, third, fourth, fifth century, all the way to the sixth century, probably around the Islamic conquest when No, oh, you're welcome to come. So, uh, redacted around the Islamic conquest, but, uh, but really has a lot of information in it. And I usually put that picture in for two reasons. The first is to show you that the, when we say the Babylonian Talmud, it's a really big corpus of text. It has a lot of text in it. Uh, and really a lot to do with scholars and, 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 and uh, has been, but the most important thing about this text is that, uh, you know, the Jewish people is known as the people of the book and that's a, a type, that's a, uh, um, um, I'm sorry that my English is a little bit distilled today, I'm really not in my best, as I explained, so I apologize in advance, uh, but uh, this is really um, the, 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 they're called this way, the people of the book, because of the Bible. But the truth is that the actual book or the actual corpus that influenced Jewish tradition or Jewish culture to this day is this one and not the Bible. This is the Babylonian Talmud by the 11th or 12th century. That becomes the most binding book. I live in a country where we actually have pieces of legislation that's still based on that. We had a judicial overhaul we've been fighting that's literally linked to this text and people trying to make this even more dominant in our life and this is a text that was redacted in the 6th or 7th century you can imagine and this leads me to my choice of pictures because that text has been studied traditionally by men and uh, uh, the fact that I can show you women studying it, the fact that I'm talking to you about this text, this is new, hasn't been the case uh, uh, um, before. When I got, uh, oh wow, you're gonna see all my emails. Uh, that's uh, my uh, when I got my position teaching Talmud in Israel in an Israeli university, I doubled the number of female Talmudists in Israel <laughs> overnight. That was like a huge deal. And it took another 12 years to get the third one to join us. So we're very happy now. I'm, I'm worth a third and not a half. But this is, uh, this is, this is really actually exciting and, and, and I'm very proud to be part of this revolution of looking at the text from differently. The second reason I bring this picture to show you how big the Talmud is is also to show you um, the Talmud is printed in different sizes and uh, most uh, uh, Orthodox Jewish houses have a very big size of it in their houses. Uh, again, I think um, trying to keep women away from it because you cannot lift this, this is too big. <laughs> so just to show you how big that is. So this is the Talmud and this is the text I want to look at when I want to talk about Jewish Christian relations and this is what I do in my studies. Now I want to ask is Christianity in the Talmud or not? Now the question seems theoretically um, weird, right? This is the same time period and that's a good question to ask. But the truth is, the question about, uh, maybe there is a way to keep this open. <laughs> I don't mind opening the door, but. Good? Keep Works? Okay. Um, so, that question has a, a, a direct uh, connection to the, the history of the scholarship and I'll, I'll talk about this in a second, but this is where my two books come in and I'm part of this new trend basically in scholarship to, to look at the Talmud and ask that question. And that trend is actually new. And the reason that it's new, and I'm part of it, and I'll, I'll name a few of the scholars that came before me, mostly uh, um, uh, Danny Boyarin and Peter Schaefer and Jeff Rubinstein, and a few others that really, Richard Kalman, uh, uh, Holger Zellent, and there's a few scholars that looked at it, but not a lot, I pretty much named all of them. Uh, uh, and, and, and that question wasn't raised in scholarship. And the question is why? And the reason is, is because of the previous slide that I showed you, because the text was such an important text in Jewish tradition, scholars, starting from the critical study of the Talmud in the 19th centuries, who studied the Talmud were mostly Orthodox male Jews who saw the text as sacred and were very comfortable not asking that question. And they would say stuff like, well, the Talmud was redacted, and I'll show you in a second, in modern day Iran and Iraq in the Persian Empire, no Christianity in this area, all the Christians are in the Roman Empire, so no need to ask that question. You can actually see scholars such as Ulbach, a very, very important 
Talmudic scholar in the 50s writing, there are no Christians in this area, so really, no need to ask that question. On the Christian side, they were very happy with that conclusion also, because as Jay-Z Smee has shown us in the 19th century and 20th century, Protestant Christians who were reading this were very comfortable with not looking for a connection between Jews and Christian, and everyone lived very happily with that conclusion. But the Talmud had nothing to do with Christianity until, I would say about 30 years or so, when the, the study of the Talmud would open up for new people, non-Jews, women, all kinds of people who are, who are willing to ask those questions. And I, I am part, I'm very, very fortunate to be part of this and very exciting because it's all new and no one asked that question before, so there's a lot to do. And I'll convince you by the end of the talk that you should all pursue this also. So this is really, really exciting and new and interesting, so this is what I do. Now, just to show you how bad things are, is the following slide. This project uh, was a finalist for um, the, um, for, um, uh, I think it was five million euros award in Germany. I was one of the last six, I didn't get it. But I, I, like, I got to the point when I had to like, present it. Uh, uh, and, um, and for that, I had to explain where the Talmud was redacted and where Jews and Christian lived. And I looked for a map that shows that. This doesn't exist. So I had to do a map, which really no one should let me do maps. I'm not, I get lost in an airport, so this is not a good person to do. But I had to make a map. So what I did is, basically I asked a, 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 a friend who's a, a graphic designer to do this, and we took a map done by uh, a Julien, which is a, she's a French scholar who did it in 2002, a map of all the Christian sites in the area. Which, by the way, 2002 is important because the Christian scholarship of this area was also very much neglected as Sebastian Brock has shown us from the 70s. So that map was also done very, very late. So she's taking all of the Christian sites and she did a map and I put that map. And over on, the, on top of that, I put a, a map uh, done by Oppenheimer in the 80s, hello, and overlapped that in the green. Just to show you, when, and again I'm going to quote Ulbach again in the 50s saying there are no Christians in the area of the Talmud next to the Jews. This is why we shouldn't ask that question. And I just want to show you this map and say I think our default assumption should be a little bit different, uh, uh, having known that. And just to show you Seleucia Ctesiphon, which is, uh, oh no, what did I do? Is there a, yeah, there we go, that's the one I wanted. So Seleucia Ctesiphon uh, is here. This is like the capital of Eastern Christianity of the time. It's right across the street from Mechoza, which is like a huge rabbinic site, and really uh, uh, um, um, very close by. And just to show that I, my default assumption is exactly the opposite. Having known that Jews and Christians live side by side, this is towards the end of the know, fifth, sixth century Sasanian Empire, knowing this map, what can the Talmud teach us about Jewish-Christian relation? That's my question of my research, which I try to answer in, in two books. Fine. So I do a book about monastic literature, I do a book about min, uh, of heretic stories, and we'll talk about this, and I find all kinds of cool examples, I think, and I'm very fortunate that the conclusion of my research along the other scholars have largely, I would say, been accepted in recent years. And people do say, okay, now we can say that the Talmud is, can be a source for Jewish Christian uh, interaction and we can we should really look for that to try and find examples before I move on and show you what I want to do next which I don't think you know what I've done so far is not enough I want to show you what I do next I want to show you what I mean when I say Jewish Christian interaction because sometimes I feel it's a little bit vague so we'll take a sh very short example from one of my books just to show you what I mean and then I want to show you with this what I want to do next on a much larger scale because my problem is, I'm going to show you an example, which I spend academics, I spend like months writing, you know, this one paper. And then I write a book, it takes me three years, and I write like whatever, five examples, and you know, very proud of that, but it's five examples out of this like huge... I want to answer the question, how much can the Talmud teach me about Jewish Christian interaction? And I want to do this on a large scale, and I want to give an example. If I give you five examples of Jewish Christian interaction, does that mean that Jews and Christian interacted a lot? A little? If I give you 20 examples, is that enough? A hundred. What kind of interaction means interaction, right? So all of these are questions that are very hard to answer if you're doing 
a book about five examples or in two books about ten examples, right? So how do you move from that anecdotal ex you know, way of looking at it to trying to answer the bigger question of Jewish-Christian interaction at that time period and that time? So that's my question in general. But before I do that, let's read some Talmud. So this is taken from my book. This is the book about heretic stories. Uh, um, this is sto these are stories, in this book I tackle and I, f I take a few stories that have like a literary structure where a heretic comes into the door, comes through the door and asks a question of a rabbi over a biblical scripture. The question looks completely idiotic. The rabbi says so. Uh, that's all the stories have the word fool in it and I try to figure out why is he called a fool and what, what does that mean. And I try to show, which is a lot of fun, it's kind of like an Agatha Christie kind of a thing, that in fact, the question is not idiotic at all. It's a very good one. It's idiotic if you don't know the Christian side of it. Once you know the Christian side of it, it's actually a representation of a Jewish Christian argument. That was the bottom line of my book. That's what I, what I do in my book. I'm going to take one example and show you and tell you what I learned about Jewish Christian attraction from that example. So, that specific story found in Tractate Chulain is, uh, tells about, about Rabbi, who is a rabbi who lived in the second century in the land of Israel. He was very, very important, rich, and powerful, and he is credited with the redaction of the Mishnah, the first rabbinic corpus that we have. So he's like a fancy one. Uh, he's so fancy that he, he's not called Rabbi Judah, even though that's his name, he's called Rabbi because everyone knows when you say Rabbi who he is, right? So that's him. And the story, even though it's about a second century Palestinian rabbi, is found in the Talmud. It's not found in earlier, so again, Persian Empire edited in the 6th century. That's the only place I find this story, even though it's told about someone much earlier, right? So again, even if I show you Jewish-Christian interaction, I will have to answer the question, does it tell about second century Palestine? Or does it say what I wanted to say, that it's about the Persian Empire? Okay, fine. So Ju he comes in, this heretic comes in, asks a question, rabbi answered, and then the rabbi, and then the heretic, so the heretic says, oh, really, this is, you know, you call me a fool, I, I want to answer. So he said, you know what, yes, go, come back after three days, and I'll give you, and, and we'll talk more. If you have an answer, come back in three days. And this is where we join the story, because I'm not here to talk to you about this, we're here to talk about the bigger project, I just want to, you know, show you an example. So, then the story gets interesting, because the story tells us that Rabbi fasted for three days. If it's like an idiotic question that's easily refutable and he's calling the other guy a fool, why is he fasting for three days until the other guy comes back with an answer? It's kind of weird, because the story is really weird, but it's only the beginning of the weirdness. So he fasts for three days. And then the three days passed, and he's about to eat. So imagine him, I don't know, with a, he's a Jewish rabbi, so obviously it's bagel and lax or whatever, the, the equivalent of a Persian, like a really big meal, right? He's sitting there, he's about, he hasn't eaten in three days. He's a fork full of food in his mouth, he's about to eat because it's like very nice and he was about to eat. I used to say in the 90th minutes and then I realized that no American in the surah I was talking about because you guys, for some weird reason, don't follow soccer. So what's the equivalent <laughs> is, uh, I don't know, a Hail Mary, like the last minute of a football game, whatever, the, your equivalent. So the very, very last minute, he's about to put a fork in his mouth. And then they say to him, yeah, can I kind of imagine, uh, you know, um, Downtown Abbey, where there's like a butler that's standing, he's like about to put his mouth, and then someone says, <coughs> right? And he's like uh, standing there and <coughs> he's here. There's a heretic waiting at the door, right? He's about to eat, he hasn't eaten in three days, and the very last minute, the guy comes back. The heretic on the door. And the rabbi is so frustrated. Remember, he hasn't eaten in three days. And when rabbis are frustrated, they use verses. So he quotes Psalms and said, they gave me golf of food. Oh, seriously, those people are giving me like poison. They gave me, uh, you know, uh, they gave me a, a, a vinegar to, 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 for my thirst. I cannot believe it. I was about to eat, right? And then he comes in and we find out that the guy that comes in is not the first one. It's the second guy. This is like uh, when I was uh, uh, doing my... Uh, um, final exams in high school, we learned this French uh, Moliere play. I don't know if you do Moliere in the States? No? French Moliere? There's a servant of two masters. The whole thing is about like this misunderstanding. You know what I'm talking about? The misunderstanding that it's not this guy, the second guy, whatever. That's the whole story. It's a funny story. It's meant to be funny. It's not the first guy, it's the second guy that comes here. Another heretic that comes through the door, right? And then 
uh, he comes into the door and he leaps. And he's so happy. He says, yay, my master, good tithing, I say to you, yay. The first guy couldn't find an answer, went up a roof and died. And everyone's like, yay, so happy. The first guy's dead, right? So they're so, so happy. And then the story goes on. Like, he invites him to eat. Really, it's really worth reading my book. But, uh, uh, and the Tom one. But that's the middle of the story. I kind of cut it in just to explain what it is. So I, in my, my, story, in my, in my book, try to say, what is the story? Of not just one heretic, two heretics, and the second one is happy, but the first one is dead. And what, what's going on, and what's the story, and the, the, the argument is about. And obviously, there's some kind of a cahoots between the second heretic and the first one. And they're dead, and he's fasting. What's happening here? I think I solved the problem, but for our purposes, I want to focus on two things in this story. The first, just to, to make clear what I want to show when I say Jewish-Christian interaction. The first is the use of the psalm verse, and the second is the, the, the term when he says when he calls on the door and he says, good timing, yay, good news, right? These are the two things I just want to focus on just to show. In my book, I try to say that this story, in fact, is a parody or a satire of some of the New Testament tradition about Jesus. And I try to show that the story basically uh, it makes a mockery of some of the things without mentioning the word Jesus or Christianity, which makes, again, the study of Jewish-Christian interaction very, very difficult. But if you, uh, you know what to look for, this is where you would look for it. And, I try, and these are two examples out of a lot of examples from this story to try to show that. So for example, um, I showed that the verse, they gave me gall from Psalms, is in fact, yes. So, um, you know, when I, uh, I, I teach at Ben Gurion University, but I uh, come for a sabbatical. This is my second sabbatical. I just finished a sabbatical at Yale. And every time I come and teach, I teach at religious studies at Yale. But when I come, the divinity school asks me to do an extra class to teach intro to rabbinics to divinity schools. And I always say yes, because it's such an incredible experience and I love teaching them. They're so eager and they don't know anything and it's so, so nice to introduce this. No, really, it's, it's nice to teach it to Adonis that wants to learn. But the one thing that I've learned and every time I do this, that my Old Testament is not my students' Old Testament. I'm not talking about New Testament, I'm talking about Old Testament. The parts that of the Old Testament that I know from synagogue and from songs and from living in Israel and from my culture is very different from the parts of the Old Testament that my divinity students knew. They know. I, Isaiah much better than I do, and I know Leviticus better than they do, and there's like really, really a lot of differences. Now this is actually really interesting for the rabbis too, because the rabbis don't treat the Old Testament equally, all parts. So there's actually a project by Michael Satlau to try to see which of the verses interest the rabbis, and not all the verses interest the rabbis. There's, you can actually see there's really nice network analysis to see, to see which, which they do in Rido. Some verses, they treat often and they have interpretation on it and midrash on it and, and, and stories about them and whatever. And some verses don't care about at all. And it's not the same spread as Christian writers of the time. Interesting in itself. Guess what? This verse in the entire rabbinic corpus and not the big one that I showed in the Talmud, I'm, I'm including the Mishnah and the Tosefta and the legal midrashim and the Agadeic midrashim and the Palestinian Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, all the way to medieval time, this verse is never, ever mentioned in the entire rabbinic corpus. This is the only time that the rabbis treat this verse. There's actually a few of those verses that the rabbis don't care about. This is one of them, and this is the only time the story is mentioned. And again, it's mentioned not as an interpretation of this verse. This is like, you remember you kind of laughed when I tell the story because it's funny. It's used in, in a humorous way, right? He's like, oh, I can't believe I, I wanted to, to eat and I can't eat it now. It's used funnily. It's not used funnily in the New Testament at all, right? This is one of the central verses for uh, when Jesus really, on the last moment on the cross before uh, he dies on the, curse, right? on, the, on the cross, right? He says that he's thirsty and he's brought vinegar instead of wine. And he said it has, it has been fulfilled. What has been fulfilled? This verse has been fulfilled in him, right? That, that he will be thirsty and they give him vinegar and then he dies on the cross. So there's a very last moment. That's a central verse in the Christian tradition. So whoever is telling this story pulls up this verse 
that no one uses in rabbinic Azure, no one cares about, doesn't do an interpretation on it, but use it funnily to say, oh my God, I'm being crucified here. Seriously, it's my last <laughs> moment on the cross, right? Doing it funnily to mock a very, very important Christian moment, right? Doing it. That's one example. Notice what I did here when I'm showing you this visually. I, I did a dot in blue and a dot in yellow, and I'm basically trying to, to say that's an interaction between that similarity, the use of this verse in the rabbinic story is proof for me that someone in the rabbinic sphere knew that tradition and is using it to mock it. So as a historian trying to ask, did Jews know Christian tradition? I don't know the answer to that one. Did the Talmud portray evidence of, Jewish tra of Christian tradition? Well, I can show that this story, I think, if I've convinced you, shows evidence that someone knew about the use of this verse and is using it, is using it mockingly. But to do that, they need to know what the New Testament is saying or some kind of, uh, we'll talk about how they knew, right? But this verse was displayed in, in the streets and the, you know, but, but this was a very, very, very known uh, uh, verse, but so how did they know? That's a different question. If you want, we can talk more about that. But someone knew and made fun of it. So for me as a historian, that's a dot of a tradition, a textual tradition that someone in the rabbinic sphere knew. That's one example. Let's do another one. And then I'll tell you what I want to do. Remember when the second heretic comes through the door? And he's like jubilant and he's like, hey, good news, yeah, mevasel tovot, and he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now good news, mevasel tovot, uh, again, he, this is where philology comes in handy. I'm, I'm a philologist at heart, very much so, and this is my number one tool to decipher these clues. Philology, someone who studied text and the history of the text and the, the, and so I'll show you what a philologist does. I went and looked for these this term in Hebrew, mevaser tovot ani lecha, or besorot tovot. There's a nominal form, it depends on which manuscript you read, but it, for our purposes, this specific term, besorot tovot, or mevaser tovot ani lecha, guess what? Never ever appear in the entire rabbinic corpus. I usually mock and say, we Jews, we don't do good news. <laughs> Right? So he says, uh, uh, good news. Now, it's not, you know, someone tr wants me to explain, but it's like, whatever. In English, you don't say, I'm, when you wear a shirt, you don't say, I'm shirting. Right? That's not a thing you say. Maybe some other culture would say it. You, in, a, in, in English, you don't say. So rabbis don't say, good news, mevasel tovot. It doesn't appear anywhere, again, in the entire huge rabbinic corpus. The only time, the only time this firm appear is here. To say what? That the guy who promised to come back after three days <laughs> didn't. He's, in fact, he's dead. That's my good news. Hey, good news. The guy who said he'll be back after three days is actually not back after three days. He's actually dead. Now let's talk about the term good news in Greek. The term good news in Greek is Evangelion, right, the good news, and very early on, this is we're talking about, end of first century, the good news is the good news, the gospel, the coming back of Jesus first after three days and then the final coming, right? But this is the gospel of Jesus' is coming back. So whoever digs up this term, who is never used in rabbinic literature, put it in the mouth of a heretic, right? Again, no Jew says that, but the, the heretics, the, this other heretic comes in through the door and says, my good news, the news we were, the gospel is that the guy who said he'll be back after days and in fact dead. Okay. Again, not, not very nice who wrote the story, obviously we have to say that, but for our purposes, and again as historians, what I want to look at is that someone knew that the term evangelion is used for, to say, to talk about the coming back of Jesus and turns it on its head to use polemically and funnily, right? And again, I'm using a dot in, in blue for the rabbinic tradition and knowledge of the green, which is the Christian tradition to call evangelion the good news, the coming back of Jesus. That's the kind of stuff I do. Again, I wanted to convince you that my work is fun, and I hope I have. This is, this is what I do for a living, and it's a lot of fun, and indeed, to like decipher stuff in what I do. 
Um, but I want to now move forward. So this, you know, I did a lot of examples, so just not a lot. I, do some, I did some examples in my book, and I showed that, and I tried to basically to show that the, the rabbinic authors knew kind of a lot about rabbinic tra uh, the Christian traditions. But it's very anecdotal, right? This is a story. I found some examples. I showed this. This is nice. But what can it tell me about the bigger knowledge of Christian tradition? So, for example, when they know the gospel, what gospel do they know? Do they know John? Do they know Matthew? Let's say they know Matthew. Which parts of Matthew? Do they know all of Matthew? How many people knew to create this story? Someone need to write this, to create this. Someone need to understand it, to put it in. I guess some people need to keep understanding it to like preserve it, but how, how, how many are we talking about? How did they know? Did they read it? Did they talk? These are so many questions that just arise from like, you know, figuring this out. Here this is where I turn to basically ask much bigger questions than the local ones. I want to ask a quantitative question and a qualitative question, like how many, how much did they know, and what kind of knowledge did they have? And for this, I want to turn to network analysis. And, and two words about network analysis, I don't know if you're like me, scared of um, um, uh, computational tools. I am terrified of those. But just to explain in a very, very simplistic term, I'm not at all an expert. But when we're, look, when we're talking about uh, um, um, network analysis, we use network analysis all the time. When I'm looking at, I still remember actually buying and the, the, the uh, when you fill up the gas, there used to be maps. Every time you would come to a place, you would buy the map and then you know, look at the maps. I actually remember that before Waze. Uh, but this is, this is a map of the major inter 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 interstate highways. That's a good one. Uh, highways of the United States. This is, an, this is an, a, a network of the highways. Now, look how much information I can get just for looking at this for a second. I can see where there's a density of people living. I can see where it was important to connect which cities to who, which city is a hub that's connected to a lot of other places, which cities are less frequently, which parts don't even have highways. Right? Look how much information I can get about the United States just from a second of just looking at this information brought visually to me. So this is one. But um, network analysis is done also to collect much more information. This is a very famous, uh, Barabasi uh, did a, a network of, um, of a blogosphere, whatever. He took a lot of information and tried to see uh, who talks to who, who responds to who. This is the very, look how much information you can get, like from the side one, you, you, know, you can hover over the dots and see what you're looking at. So it's a snapshot of a, of a lot of information that you can get. Uh, from this. And so the project that I want to suggest is basically taking the dots that I've shown you of literary or cultural or religious tradition and knowledge between them, these dots and connecting them and doing this on a much larger scale and talking about Jewish Christian interaction and basically figure out what the Talmud can teach me. That's the project. To do that, again, I'm telling you what the project overall goal is. I am somewhere in the very, very beginning of it, but I want to tell you about this and what I want to do. So the first would be create a database, collect all of the information, all of the examples that scholars have found, that I'm actually already doing that part. It's not a lot, so it's kind of easy. Second is actually programming AI to find the uh, connection automatically. So for example, for my book, let's say I'm doing good news or I'm doing, I don't know, I have a, a chapter about uh, Chalitza, which is a removing of the shoe in case of whatever someone doesn't want to marry, his sister-in-law, not going to go into that. But let's say I look into that in Christian tradition. I had to go through Syriac and Greek and Latin and, 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 and Aramaic, obviously, and look for the word shoe or sandal, or footwear, and you know, I had to every time look, I'm very, very fortunate that I have, you know, databases that I can do that, but I had to do it. Imagine if a computer on its own would suggest parallels, there'll be a lot of noise and a lot of stuff that doesn't, you know, interact, but the amount of, and that took me, I would say, you know, a month to find out that, you know, article to, 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 to make it happen. So an AI that will automatically find the parallels would be incredible. We have the, uh, uh, um, we have the technology, I'll talk about it in a second. So that's stage number one. So I want to do a lot of dots and a lot of lines and connect them. 
Second, I want to do network analysis of all dots and dots, and then ask the question. So I want to show you how it looks. So the first one, creating the database and again, collecting everything and programming, and I want to talk about the programming for a second, because I talked about Shu, but I told you uh, that next to Shu I can do where, and I can do close, and I can do, I don't know, divorce, and I can do a lot of words that goes around Shu. Um, and the, the, the technology exists. We do this every time you do a Google search now. And you do something similar, and then you get similar results because Google knows your mind and can look for stuff. It's called uh, NLP, it's called uh, uh, Natural uh, Language Processing, where uh, this is what we call distant reading. Google knows that when you have shoe, you have a lot of words that goes attached to that. So he's already looking for other words to match as well. So when you do a queen, it will look for a king or a woman or royalty or a palace. There's a, like a bunch of words that goes with it and it will suggest to you, uh, it's kind of like you know how Facebook targets you with clothes after you buy one thing because they're like, oh, all the women who are like 44 years like you, who teaches in academia, like that dress. So they'll also like these shoes and this dress, and they're so right most of the time, uh, right? Because they know, because it comes like in a, in a group. That's what they do. And I can use that, not just to buy, to waste money and to buy clothes, but also to find parallels. So this is what the technology is already there and we can actually do that. That's number one. Number two is the network analysis and this is what I want to show you. This is because this is where I have some results to show you. So this is where you need to meet my friend. This is Yossi Yovel. Yossi Yovel is a scholar of bats. And I've met Yossi Yovel when we were both on the Young Academy of Sciences in Israel. And we were, uh, this is like um, the Academy of Sciences where the old, very distinguished people, they have a, like a younger branch where you were chosen for four years. And I was chosen uh, every year, 30 uh, scholars are chosen. Uh, and Yossi was chosen as well. And we became uh, friends. And then COVID hit. And we were stuck at home with our little children. And so he said, do you have a seminar that I can join via Zoom? I said, yeah, I'll join my Jewish Christian seminar. And he, my kids, oh my God, we listened to all his bats talk. We did a lot of bats during COVID. It was a lot of fun and obviously bats and COVID. So he was very well thought. They didn't, the bats are not at fault. I'm already convinced by that. But in any case, we became very close friends. And he, at some point he said, why aren't you using network analysis to try to move this forward and try to look at a larger question. And for this he explained uh, uh, using another network analysis, this one of his bets. Um, so this is taken from an ex uh, experiment that he did where he tried to show that bats, he tried to ask, do bats barter sex for food? So let's say uh, a man would give a female, uh, not a male bat would give a female bat some food, would she be more willing to have sex with him? or whatever scientific word you'd say for sex with bats, but uh, some kind of like, you know, uh, 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 intercourse. Now, so he, he, so Yossi actually is the head of the uh, uh, um, School of Neuroscience at Tel Aviv University, and he has a bat colony at Tel Aviv University. So he does all this uh, research on the bats, and look at his uh, uh, network, right? So he, he, so the blue are, the, the black are the, the, the male bats and the, the the white are the female bats, and you can see that there's like direction, which bats talk to who, who, who had sex with who, and look, you can see the, the, the level, the, the thickness of it, how many times, or whatever. So look how much information you can get from this like one snapshot. And he's like, let's do it with your story of Julian. So this is the first uh, network analysis that we did. Um, this is the Hulin story, that we, the story of the rabbi and the heretic, and there's a lot of details here which we didn't go through, but you can recognize um, uh, which one? Evangelion, the good news one here that you can see, right? And did they know or did they not know? Do you have a timeline of, uh, of where this tradition appears and who quotes it else, right? They don't know, I don't know if the Talmud knows this specific person, but that tradition also appears in that person. You see uh, the, 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 the color of the blue changes from Eastern to Western. Ambrose in Rome is like the most Western one. So you, can, you have so much information here, right? What else, something else that we did to show is that another rabbinic tradition knows something. Evangelion is a book, whatever, I'm not gonna go into that. So we can even say maybe if two rabbinic sources know the third Christian tradition, maybe that shows connection between two rabbinic traditions. So there's a lot to see from this. Uh, you can see the, the thickness of it for us. Are we sure? Are we not sure of the thickness of it? So that's 
an example of this. By the way, it looks very simple to do this. It took us, I would say, eight months and a lot of fighting. Uh, we sat once a week for two hours, and he comes from science, like whatever, biology, and I come from humanities, and it was hell to work together. This is one of the problems with interdisciplinary studies, because he would say, so, so give me a dot. And I'm like, I can't give you a dot, I wrote 30 pages on it, I, I can't like summarize it in a dot, there's something very um, flat about just writing good news. I need to explain what good news means, and that. he's like, no. He has bats, they gave food, had sex, it's like it's a dot. What, what, like what's wrong with you? And I'm like, no, this, it was so hard to do and giving up the, co the complexity of the book and everything, it was very, very hard to do. That's our first one. But then we took this one and slashed it differently. And this is where it gets interesting. So we did uh, uh, um, X's, uh, uh, X, uh, this is in English, an X, uh, 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 there's an X and a Y. Uh, y axis, X's, X's, okay, yeah. X axis and Y axis. Oh, okay. Uh, so this is so this is the timeline. The same thing that we saw in the round, right? This is uh, 100 B uh, CE and the 300 and 500. And this is the Y is, is geography. So we're we're looking at the you know this is from the, uh, the around the land of Israel and this is like more to the west, whatever. And this is the rabbinic sources and with the timeline goes for the Christian sources. Same thing. But this case, what I did is I color coded the lines according to the content of the connection. If the rabbis made fun of a Christian tradition, I did it in red. If they just showed familiarity without making fun, blue. Just tried it out. And look what I saw. The more advanced the Christian tradition in time is, the later the Christian tradition, the less polemical the rabbis were. When it came to the tradition that came from the New Testament, the rabbis are like mocking it more and making fun of it. But when it came to like church fathers, they weren't mocking it. They were just showing knowledge of it and portraying it. Now, is this true? That the rabbi polemicized more about sources coming from the New Testament more than they do about sources coming from church fathers? No clue. I just did this one. I don't know if that's true for everything. But look how interesting that is because it never occurred to me to ask that question. More than that, look, the more I advance in time, the more geographically diverse the sources the rabbis know. At first, they only know the early sources from this area, like I would say second century, third century. It's very local, but the more they advance in time, the more diverse is. They know sources from the Talmud, know stuff all the way to the West. Is that always true? No idea. I only did this like on a very short little amount of information. But already I have new questions that I didn't think of asking when I was writing my book. To convince you all that asking, taking a step back, doing something very flat of dots and lines, actually can, alongside my very elaborate books that I spend a lot of pages writing, can give us another tool in the toolbox to ask much bigger questions that can actually then revert you know, push me back, back into my book. Uh, just to show you, this is another one that we did. I don't have a lot of time because I want to, uh, I want to leave time for questions, but this is another one that we did using an algorithm, Google rank algorithm. How much of a, this is, uh, where is my Christian? Uh, uh, this is, this is about uh, Apophthegmata Patrum, which I claim in my first book that the rabbis knew. So this specific source is quoted many times, and I, so this is why the dot is bigger as opposed to other sources. And then I, to ask, well, does this matter? Like, that they, did, which sources do you know? Did you know more? Did they not? Whatever. So this is, in this case, here, nothing is polemical with the monastic sources much later, much more diverse geographically and not polemical. Is that a coincidence? No clue, because I only did like a very small sample. But at least that's an interesting question that I didn't think of asking beforehand. So the, describing the literal interaction and drawing conclusion about the real life interaction between Jews and Christians gets to a whole new level once I start asking a quantitative on a large, large scale question. So, the connection between rabbis and, 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 and Christian authors, do they exist? What's the distribution of them? What's the level of them? Do they just know the, like, the fancy Sermon of the Mount parts? Do they know like the weird stuff in the corner that no one else knows? Uh, what's the level of connections? Do they just like mock? Do they interact seriously with? 
in which parts. All of these are like new patterns I didn't think about. I also showed you two, geographical and chronological, polemical versus not polemical. These are new patterns that I didn't know until I actually sliced the, the, the data this way. So it really leads us to a whole new level of questions. So the idea is basically is to take that one example that I showed you from Hulin and do much more to all of the all of the stuff that I will find through AI and, and, and other scholars have found and try to really try to basically do this. And this is in my concluding uh, slide. Try basically to take rabbinic and Christian sources, try to figure it out. This is a book. I, this is, I do it from the Jewish side, but obviously I haven't had time to talk about the Christian side. This is my colleague. Uh, uh, to, uh, Tobias Nicholas from, from Regensburg University, he does it from the Christian side. But obviously you could do it from all sides, slowly t look over it, but then try to also use network analysis to ask, to take a step back and ask a much bigger question and try to slice the question, slice the sources this way, and then go back and ask, well, how does it change the scholarship that we've been doing and doing it, uh, uh, um, basically asking new questions and leading us to new patterns. Uh, what's the output of it? So the idea is basically to get to a uh, scholarly monograph and obviously putting it, everything out there, uh, open access for everyone to use because the technology should be uh, widely distributed. Here I'm here to tell you that I've, we've already started. So we've recruited some money from the Solar Boss Texas Foundation and I'm happy to say they're local, they're from Austin, Texas, they're uh, uh, donors from Ben Gurion University and I'm very, very proud that they thought that this was promising enough. So we've started this project, we're just in the beginning, we need much, much more, more money. Too bad the German thing didn't come through, but this is it. And our first, actually, the first uh, um, uh, results were just published. Uh, um, when was that, May? May? Published, May. Beginning of May, I was published in Nature Humanities. It was very, very hard to publish it. I have to, usually you just, you know, flaunt the bottom line. It wasn't easy uh, to try to convince someone that a, a research scholarship with a bat scholar and a Talmud scholar is worth <laughs> listening to. It looks like a, you know, a gimmick or some kind. It was very hard to publish and we got a lot of like, uh, uh, um, uh, comments. It went through, I think, six rounds until it was published. Uh, and it was judged by people who do social sciences, which neither me or Yossi do. So it was very hard and this brings into play the question of funding for, inter, uh, uh, for collaboration between what we call FAR um, um, uh, interdisciplinary studies. Doesn't exist. In Israel there's no such thing. When I have to apply for grants it's either in the Talmud or in biology and guess what? They don't care in biology about the Talmud and in Talmud, they have a really hard time understanding network analysis. So we actually get like, re, you know, a reaction. We have a very, very hard finding fundings. And when you go uh, uh, outside of Israel for other funding agencies, it's very, very hard to convince agencies to, do, to fund such things. Which led me to go to a, um, uh, um, uh, the Rothschild Foundation in Israel, Yad and Adiv, and get 2.5 million shekels to start uh, Pumbi, which is a forum for interdisciplinary study. We had two rounds of it. We got the best scholars in Israel uh, from physics, chemistry, biology, etc., for a three days retreat in Israel. We did it twice. And then we founded, uh, we, uh, I assembled, I assembled a, a, a judges panel of Nobel Prize winners, head of university, the head of the budgeting committee in Israel, of all of Israel in the government. So we had a very fancy, judging committee, which judged the, the results of what came from the retreat, and they funded four research in the budget of 2.5 million shekels, and next year we're going to see the results, hopefully, we have a retreat coming in, and hopefully coming with that to the Israeli government and trying to convince them to fund more interdisciplinary studies. So that all started with BATS and Talmud. All of this to say that, you, you know, usually you just talk about the success and you don't talk about the struggles of how hard it is to basically do this. Um, and it all depends on doing, getting that far, depends on the goodwill of Yossi and myself to find two hours a day doing something that is not funded and is not, you know, sought after and just because we believe that this is important. Uh, so just to show the struggle of this kind of uh, 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 study. But at the end of the day, the impact of it, I think, is worthwhile. Because I really, really think that 
t you know, stepping out of my comfort zone. I am not a math person. I do not do network analysis or computational theory, not at all. But stepping out of my comfort zone really convinced me that incorporating digital humanities into this is extremely important and could really advance the study of rabbinic literature, but at the end of the day, giving us a kind of a bird's eye view of the question of Jewish Christian interaction, which is, a, I think, a really crucial question of the history of both religions. Uh, and lastly, putting rabbinic literature back into the box of religious studies in the whole. We're part of the matrix, and this shouldn't be uh, you know, something esoteric on the side, not connected. It's not. It is part of the matrix of late antiquity. And us as human beings, and I'm saying that now living in the 21st century, in the complicated religious world that we live in, and religious wars that we live in, rabbinics and ancient Christianity is part of that matrix of understanding human behavior and human history, and it has to be brought back into that. And I think this is uh, a good step in that direction, trying to step back and ask uh, about a bigger question. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, so you talked about um, language learning models, AI, and stuff like that. And uh, I apologize if I get the terminology wrong. Um, but I, I was wouldn't kind of, know, probably. Yes. I was kind of wondering, like, um, just with like the stochastic models that we have now, like, uh, it's kind of based on English and like our culture now. Uh, and I was just kind of wondering, like, what your plans or ideas are for how to, like, um, I guess, place the uh, models within the cultural and linguistic context of what you're studying? This is, this is actually a really, really good question because I'm going to actually bring it down even one notch down uh, to ask which language am I looking for the parallels? Because, right, the Christian sources are in Latin, Greek, Syriac. The, Hebrew, the, the rabbinic sources are in Hebrew and Aramaic. How do you even begin to look for parallels? And the answer is, you could do it in different languages, there's technology involved, but the truth is translation is actually a really good way to bypass that. If you use, let's say, English, which is the easiest, and that's the one that has the most. So for example, when I talk about those parallel stuff, Semitic languages are so far behind because there's not enough people interested in that, so the development on, on those AI tools or NLP tools in Aramaic and Hebrew are so far behind, it's very hard to find that. But in English it exists and very widely because we all use it in Google and, and other... Um, um, so uh, using English is a really good solution. What's the problem with that? Western sources have been translated into English long ago, 19th, 18th century, so the translations are extremely antiquated. And then when you look at, uh, let's say, Syriac sources, most of them haven't been translated at all. And if they have, they have been translated lamp in the 20th to 21st century. So you would find thou, or all kinds of like weird, I was looking for belt, so there's like uh, the monastic belt, I did like a piece on, on that. Um, so you have um, um, a corset, and you have um, girdle all kinds of like weird words such as this, and then like a belt and whatever. So you have to know, like th this is a whole, this is where the smart uh, uh, um, far reading uh, uh, is helpful. Because once you don't deal with specific words, but through its translation use a bunch of words and do that when you don't feed it to the computer, but the computer itself does the, 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 the this cluster, what we call clusters of words, then it solves the problem. So this is, the truth is, the, the amount of new stuff that has been developed in the past, I would say, a year or, so, or two, and we've been working on it, COVID, like I would say three or four years. Uh, I, I have like a bunch of friends who do digital humanities. In the past year or so, this has become so much easier to do, and the results are much better. So obviously we go through a lot of like uh, noise, a lot of stuff that are not, but we're much closer to that. But for this I need a lot of money because I need like programmers to help me do that. So I'm not there yet, I'm still doing the network and lots of the stuff that I can do by hand. But if I will get some kind of grant that will allow me to do that, I think that actually we're better off, but it's new, new that we can do that through English. So that well, we do. What, um, is it music? Is there uh, what musically have you found? What music? Musically? Musically? Like music. Explain. So, um, 
is there uh, is there any interactions in the music in the town? You know, Are you seeing uh, any connections between Christians and Jews in terms of their music? The music? music hmm. I love that question, and I'll tell you why. Um, we don't know about music. We don't have any knowledge of that. But I will take your question and move it to a slightly different thing. And we'll talk about uh, uh, noise in general or sound. Is there music in the Talmud? They're referring to some music, but not, not something that I can work with. There's no like notes or there are some songs. There's songs in there the are some songs. There are some words for some, some stuff that are very short and like dismantled some, some places. There, there are a little. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I want to take your question and move it to another direction and talk about sound in general. And the reason I'm talking about that, because Yossi, Yuvel, is like, fine, network analysis, that's one thing. But what he's really an expert of is uh, echolocation, the bats, right? Because the bats, they use echolocation for this. So he's like, let's do some sound in the Talmud. And we actually located a few uh, passages in the Talmud. This is new, 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 new. Invite me again, I'll give a talk about that one. Uh, uh, about uh, stuff, for example, uh, the talk about an entire thing in Tractate Rosh Hashanah. Uh, in the temple, they used to do the, the shofar in Rosh Hashanah alongside two trumpets, because it was fancier. But then the Talmud asks, wait, can you hear the shofar if you have two trumpets next to it? So you can actually go through what their hearing or their sound concept was about hearing two things at the same time, and we can actually test if they were right or wrong, right? So we can do that. Or the Talmud says, for example, you can, uh, does it work if you blow the shofar into a pit and you hear the echo? Does it still count or not? So we're actually planning and we actually found the pit that we can use and this is like, and then really don't ask me how I like, you know, I'm gonna rob a museum of a pit and I have like a connection to do that and to try to do this experience for an hour and then bring it back. But we'll do a thing and a whole experience because that's what he does. He's a sound expert with the bats and we can actually try and test some of the assumption that the people had 1500 years ago. So we actually can do some stuff with sound and it actually goes hand in hand with very new research. This has exploded in the past 20 years of the senses in the ancient times and can we access senses and actually there's an Institute of Sacred Music at Yale University that does some really awesome stuff with like music in churches and ancient churches and try to recreate that. So we can do that too. And I think our scholarship goes hand in hand with that one and, and we're looking at that. So I'm happy about that question, but this is new. I haven't done the experiment yet, but we're going in that direction. Uh, I'm sorry, guys, one more. Is it, what about uh, ma uh, marriage? Uh, Weddings or something like that? Weddings in Jewish Christian stuff. There are some, there's a lot of discussion about marriage and marriage law. And I have found some parallels to Christian stuff and interesting. So, yes, there is. The short answer is yes, there is. I think Martha wants to ask a question. Either Mike or not, but. Thanks. Yeah. This was wonderful. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you. Um, uh, so, you very carefully did not um, speculate about the mocking and then the lack of mocking. Um, but I was wondering if you would. Um, and more than that, I was wondering, sort of connected to that, I guess, in my head, um, to say something, of what, what, do we know anything, I guess, about the, um, the sort of, Relation, the, the relations of power between Christians and Jews in the area of Babylonia at this period, and you know, is mocking something you do, you know, to a heretic and not to somebody who's equal or more powerful, or is mocking something that you do because you're not powerful and you're <laughs> trying to make fun of the people you don't like? Uh, so I just was curious if you have any thoughts about sort of how that works with the kind of political environment that people are living in. It's, a, it's such a, an incredible question, and I'll tell you why it's incredible for multiple ways. The first is, um, so let's start with the simple fact that I don't think these stories represent an actual interaction between Jews and Christian. The fact that they're told over someone who lived many years before in a different uh, country, uh, I think this is meant for an inner discussion, and it doesn't deal with Christianity in the second century, it deals with Christianity in the fifth and sixth century, local, contemporaneous. And I can actually show that because 
the argument that they're arguing about, uh, it's about the Holy Spirit and could not have happened before the fourth century in Christian sources. So I can actually show that this is totally later. So we're talking about Jews and Christian in the fourth and fifth century or sixth century in the Persian Empire. That's what we're talking about historically. What do we know about those? We know that Christianity is the biggest religious minority by this point. They're a, a strong economical force in this area. Um, the Persian um, suspect the Christians of being a uh, um, uh, fifth column, the, you know, the, the Spanish uh, uh, term, the Spanish Revolution term, uh, the traitors within. So they're uh, pre being persecuted for a time and then not so much later. And there, so there's a, this whole thing. So that's a good question. Uh, and the question is, can the Talmud help me answer that question? And I think it can. Mockery. I think I'm the only Talmud scholar ever to quote uh, Stephen Colbert in my book. <laughs> and the reason that I quote Stephen Colbert in my book is because the, after the, the end of my book, the, the, my second book, it, the, the, the meaning, the heretic stories are all about mockery. And I said, listen, as a historian, I can say a few things from this. I can say that someone who mocks needs to know a lot, right? If you go to a stand-up comedian, I always give that example. You know, a woman stand-up comedian telling how difficult it is to, to get up in the morning when it's raining, and you have three kids, and you have to take them out to the, like, the school, and one you know, drops the umbrella, and he forgets his shoe and his coat and taking him out. And it's funny to everyone, but it's even funnier if you try to do to take three out, kids out in the rain. It's much you know, relatable if you've done it. So you need someone to know the material to, to make the joke, right? If the stand-up community didn't have kids, it wouldn't have been as funny if she didn't, she did. So she needed to know that to make the joke. I needed to be in the audience to say, oh wait, I've tried that and it's, it is funny and bitter, uh, but funny, because uh, I did that. So someone in the audience had to understand that question. So I can say someone told that story because they knew about the Christian stuff. Someone understood enough to put it in. How many? And here I go to Stephen Colbert. Because I can think of a few options. I can say, maybe this is like a SNL sketch that everyone gets. And it's funny, and it's like you know, humor, and Eretz and Ederetz in Israel. This is like a common humor. Everyone gets it. Then we're talking about a lot of people who know about Christian tradition. Or is it Jane Austen kind of humor? Mr. Darcy, you know, mumbling a funny joke, and only the sister, the bratty sister, gets it. And that's enough for him, even though everyone else doesn't get it. So is it that kind of humor, that they're like a lead group making fun of Christian and no one gets the joke? Or is it Stephen Colbert? Because Stephen Colbert, I don't know if he does like a dual humor thing. I watch Stephen Colbert because I like his monologue. I don't get like 60% of the joke because I don't live here and most of the time. And it's still funny enough for me to watch. And a lot of the time, by the way, he's extremely knowledgeable about ancient Christianity. He does a lot of stuff about Catholic and, and, and whatever. But sometimes he makes those jokes that he knows that only a part of his audience would get. Even Americans don't get all of his joke. And it's still funny enough to be, a, he used to be like the number one late night show. I don't know if it's still true. But he does it so well, even though he does high humor. So it's this kind of thing, that the Talmud has it inside, but not everyone gets it. But it's funny enough to, make, to mock a question, even though you don't get it. So I write this whole thing, and I don't know, because that's a historical question that I don't know. And I thought that was it. That I, and then I met Yaray Shurun. And Yaray Shurun is a scholar in Tel Aviv University who does brain images. She does fMRI. And she tests this on people. She tests how much of a joke, how much of a prior knowledge you need in order to laugh from a joke. And we're going to run a list of experiments, and we'll see. Because we live in a country where people are not educated in Christian culture, so I have enough of subjects. We don't know anything about Christianity. I'm going to tell the stories about the Talmud. I'm going to tell them with the, the background and without the background, and we'll check start parts of the brain. Will it lead me to an answer? I don't know. But at least there is some way to start checking it. So I'm very excited about that one. I'm telling you about all my new research projects that I haven't begun yet. But this is where I'm going. But this is, these are questions that I'm interested in, and I'm not sure that I'll ever be able to answer, but it's an, enough to ask. And lastly, it's not nice to mock. I'm telling you all. It's funny, but it's not nice to mock, right? It's not nice to mock the last moment of Jesus on the cross. But if it's an inside thing, it's different than an, you know, an outside thing. Also, I show that in a lot of the time, the story project anxiety. You mock, but you're very scared of it. This story, Rabbi fasts for three days. He's super scared of what the answer of the guy is. And, that's, and the story ends by him dying and doesn't resume 
the conversation. So the story is saying, you know what, I don't have a good answer for that. So they're mocking, but they're also projecting, I'm so scared of this Christian argument and I don't know what to do with that. And thank God he's dead because I don't have to deal with that. So I also show that the rabbis by alongside mockery show real anxiety from the Christian point of view. And that's interesting to me because you can mock, but you also show your weak spot. And that makes Jewish Christian interaction or religious interaction in general so much more interesting because people are people are people. And I think it's a good place to stop, right? <laughs> Please join me in thanking thank Professor Borsha. Thank you. Thank you so much.